Welcome to Burning Questions. This is Quellfire's show where we talk about industry topics. We like to give our opinions and views, but main thing is to answer common questions that we get from our customers. Today's subject is early engagement, and I'm joined by Craig Wells, uh, who's going to help me discuss this. Uh, thanks for joining me, Craig. Just for the audience, if you can just give a brief introduction to yourself, just in case they don't know um, who you are, even though you're in plenty of Quellfire videos, um, that'd be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you, Alec. Yeah, my name is Craig Wells. I'm the sales director here at Quellfire. So I have the privilege of uh, leading the technical customer service and, and the sales team. We're all very passionate about saving lives, about protecting people and property. And indeed, I'm very passionate myself about the whole concept of early engagement. So yeah, delighted to be sharing the uh, opportunity to talk about some best practice and uh, some suggested processes that you might want to think about adopting as well. Uh, yeah, thank you for joining me. And it's, so it's an important subject. I know at the moment uh, for, for the audience, it's probably a hot topic, but since I've been at Quellfire, you, you've always been an advocate of early engagement long before I joined. So it's something that we've taken to heart quite well. Um, and the reason why I think this is important for all of those that have watched our previous episodes, you're going to see now how it's all going to start coming together. I mean, we talked a little bit about fire science. We talked about service penetrations. Um, the products that are used last episode was the um, testing and certification. Now, this is where you're going to start to bring it all together and you'll start to understand why it's important. Um, so, yeah, with that in mind, then, Craig, actually, just to sort of help the audience, can you sort of explain what is early engagement um, to, to them, just so they can understand actually what we're talking about? Sure. So, I mean, early engagement, the, the clue really is in the name. It is all about engaging very early on um, before you start constructing and um, before you get too far down the line to identify tested solutions so as you say in the last episode you covered what goes into the test evidence um, the production and the certification yeah. um, where there is a clearly outlined scope of application you know the products can be used in a prescribed scope there are limitations to how the products can be used so what we really need to see is your buildings being designed with the tested scope of application in mind, which unfortunately hasn't always been the case. Oh, um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, many of our audience will be familiar, unfortunately, with, with terrible pictures, um, something like this. Fire resistant expanding foam filler, as it's you know, properly known. But unfortunately, it's um, a classic case of a misunderstood product. It says four hours on the tin. But you've got to think about where will it achieve four hours? And, and you know, you've got to look into that tested scope of application. Um, so, you know, pink foam is not the only, the only product. There's a you know, massive understanding about many products, you know. Yeah. And indeed, yeah. I've heard the phrase used historically, um, as to if it's white, it will be all right. You know, if there's fire, bat and sealant around the services, well, it will be all right. No, there are there is a tested scope of application. There are limitations on how the products can be used. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you know something um, like this, for instance, is almost just as bad. Okay, we've got a nicely formed letterbox detail um, within the fire rated plasterboard wall. We've got various services all running through, which you know on on face value are quite neat. They're straight. Um, they're tidy, but. There is absolutely no way that you would actually be able to fit the relevant um, fire stop products into that opening around the services, taking into consideration all the, the spatial requirements, the spaces of the seals, the space between the seals, um, etc. And you know, never mind the actual practical aspect of it. So this is probably you know, a classic example of where the traditional approach to fire stopping has tended to be. Um, well, we need to build the walls, we need to get the services in, we'll call the fire stopper in at the end of the project and expect them to be able to install the products yeah. and just plug give us out. a certificate. Yeah. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sure you see uh, plenty of examples of this from, from a technical yeah. inquiry yeah. perspective. Yeah, huge. I mean, that, I mean, both are obviously problematic. We're seeing this more in a remedial thing, which is done in the day, just like you said, because people are um, they're misunderstanding the product, they think it's fire stopping, but Typically, foam is for very, very small linear gaps. It's nothing to do with service penetrations. And yeah, on the one on the on the left there is a daily occurrence at the moment. Yeah, it looks neat, but what people don't realise is there's a lot of not necessarily just spacing, which we'll come into. There's a lot of factors there that 
are kind of red flags to me as a, from a technical side. Um, so there's a lot of considerations there. So yeah, that's that's obviously why uh, early engagement is important. So I mean, it's not really sort of like a um, like a new concept though, is it? It's, it's been something that's been well, it should have always been it done. Should always be, but it's it's a it's a misunderstanding of the products and. You know, dare I say it, a, um, a certain denial, you know, people not necessarily wanting to get into the detail of it. Why is that? Well, A, probably because they think it's someone else's responsibility, um, and B, they're worried they're not going to understand what they're, they're expected to read and what have you. But I guess that's you know, where we come in with the, with the education and helping people understand why they need to do what they need to do. Yeah. So if we take a, a very typical um, service penetration, multi-service penetration yeah. still here, which would be typical of a, a, a flat or apartment entrance where you've got multiple services going through. It's also worth considering that there are multiple trades involved. Yeah. And although the fire stopper takes the final you know, responsibility for installing the fire stop products, they're only an installer of a tested system. Yeah. So all those associated trades you know, be it the dry liner, the electrician, the plumber, the spring crystal, the ventilation contractor, they all directly impact the ability of the fire stopper to install the products in accordance with the tested scope of application. Yeah. So, sorry, that sounds a little bit wordy, but ultimately everyone is responsible for the overall performance of the seal. Yeah. But ultimately, um, well, historically, we've probably tended to just kind of create those apertures as we saw on the, the, the other image, pull all the services through and then expect the fire stopper to take full and final responsibility. Yeah, no, I definitely... So the whole concept of early engagement is really to educate, yes, um, but bring together all those associated trades to understand that their input, their workmanship directly affects the overall performance of the fire stop seal. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, there are, as we've just alluded to, lots of key considerations of the tested scope of application, which you could you could point out better than me, Alec. Yeah, no, um, definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously just before I do that, I mean, one of the points I like where you mention all the trades there is it kind of then happens that to be able to coordinate all them, you need a plan. So without having a, that plan to start with, there's no way that you can coordinate the dry line and the plumber, etc. And there are a lot of considerations here. I mean, these are very common services. You've got cables, sprinkler pipes, etc. But you can see that there's different products straight away, and they are being used um, because of certain considerations like the fire rating, spacing, uh, that that side of things. So it's yeah, there's a lot of considerations to get something like that. It looks very simple on paper, but there is a lot of forethought into into designing something like that. Um, yeah, and spacings is a big one. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, I guess the point uh, I'd like to make as well is that this is not a new concept. No. Um, you know, it has always been a requirement. So Reber Stage 3 is all about spatial coordination. Um, so yes, you know, maybe you haven't paid that much attention in the past to the sort of level of detail that we've been talking about in, in connection with fire stopping. But Reber Stage 3, spatial coordination, it all comes into it. So early engagement, you know, is absolutely critical to to identify suitably tested solutions, um, and then to make sure that we're observing the spatial requirements, um, and of course coordinating it between all the trades. Um, indeed, the um, there is this fantastic best practice guide which has been uh, prepared by a number of the trade associations, including the ASFB and BISA and FIS and others. Fantastic guide. It's quite a bit of reading, um, admittedly, but it's well worth getting into, isn't yeah, it, Alex? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, and when you boil it down, there are nine golden rules. Um, the first one, of course, being ensure an early engagement with fire stopping manufacturers and installers. Now, what is interesting is if we actually look at the balance of these uh, of design and installation rules, seven out of those golden rules, or those nine golden rules, should I say, are all to do with design. The final two are about installation. 
So that probably starts to uh, give us a little bit of inkling into where the focus needs to be. Yeah, um, you know, I think historically there's been a, a nominal amount of design done. There's been a consideration. Yes, we need to do some fire stopping around the service penetrations, but we rely on the installer coming in. Um, but ultimately, if we put the effort and the focus up front early into the design, making sure everything is compliant at design stage, it becomes much more achievable to, to achieve compliance um, at the installation stage. Yeah, no, so. yeah, no, no the, the, the guide that Craig Bett mentioned is very good. I, I would advise anyone to try and read it. It's free to download at um, various websites. Um, <clears throat> if you do need a copy, just um, email our technical team and I'll send it across. But the rules are very uh, broken down. It, obviously, we won't go for it on this video, but they're broken down and they sort of explain the different aspects uh, of why the early engagement is important. And it's kind of, I mean, I know obviously hot topics at the moment are like gateways and design and build and stuff. And this emphasized why it's very important that buildings should be designed before the build, where traditionally they start the build and they think of designing on the fly and it usually causes so many problems down the line that um, it, it just shows that you can cut all of that time wastage, money wastage, rework if you just spend that little bit of effort designing prior to it building, it does pay off in dividends. One of the um, the important golden rules that I think actually is, something is number four, and that says follow the design process for penetration seals. Now that's quite a good thing, I think, for designers to sort of say, to have a process in mind, it will help them with all their projects. So that's something, I mean, can you sort of elaborate more on that sort of process that works? Yeah, thanks, Alex. So um, here is a suggested process, um, I guess every, Every client, every contractor, every architect may have their own uh, way of doing things based on you know, contractual obligations and, and commercial agreements. But ultimately, it's all about engaging early with all the relevant trades to identify the appropriate solution and bringing together all the tested solutions um, from, a, from a compliance perspective, but also from a commercial viability, but also from a practical perspective as well. So what you don't want to be doing is rushing into building a building with, you know, perhaps a great tested solution, which is far too expensive or even not practical to actually achieve. Yeah. So the, one of the suggested processes is to, the starting point is to determine your fire strategy requirements. Okay, yeah. they're, they're kind of the, the non-negotiables. You know, you've got to have a certain fire rating, you've got to have certain walls and certain floors in certain places. From then, from that, you then need to determine how are those compartment lines going to be compromised. So, in other words, what services need to be installed? Um, and also, I would go further than that and say, you know, what services do you want to be installed? So, it's really important that an early engagement is happening where there is, there is an element of flexibility. Definitely. So if you want to use a particular insulation or you, you, you would like to achieve a particular you know, U value with a certain insulation, that's all well and good. But if there isn't a fire tested solution, you might have to be making some compromises. So it's important to have these conversations at an early stage. So you're identifying your wants and your needs, the types of pipes, the types of cables, types of dampers, types of insulation, um, and indeed, the actual walls and floors. You yourself, Alec, know that there are lots of different types of wall and yeah, floor. Yeah. Um, and not all, not all are tested. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. So it's, so yeah, it's big uh, picture, really. Yeah. Identifying all your wants and needs, you might want to use a particular wall system. Well, if there's no test evidence for service penetrations through that particular wall system, you know, is there time to get something tested? Um, or do you have to, to make a compromise on it? Then you also need to think about how you want to put those services through the wall or the floor. Are you going to drill the hole to the optimum size and put what we call a direct seal? Or are you going to create letter boxes and use a fire bat or, or a fire protection compound detail, for instance? So again, having some idea of how you want to make those penetrations. Um, and then, of course, making sure that you, you can uh, achieve that. Um, Fire dampers, tested to a different standard, Alec. Yeah. Um, so, yep. Yeah, um, they they need they need the, the same approach, but obviously a separate approach because dampers are different to other surface penetrations. So you're then going to engage with the manufacturer of fire stop solutions. 
um, i.e. qualifier, and identify whether there are suitable tested solutions to achieve that particular fire rating that you need, that particular pipe, insulation, cable, whatever it is that you want. Um, and of course, you know, combined with the, 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 the floor or the wall substrate that you want to achieve. So you identify the tested solutions. And then the key thing is for the designer to bring together all those details. So for, for all the different types of services and walls and floors, and of course the dampers and, and other details, combine them all together, can it into one design. And then the key thing is to then go back out to the supply chain. So back out to the all the relevant trades. And we've talked on the previous slide about the plumber and the electrician and the dry liner and the ventilation and the sprinkler installer, you know, to check that they are happy with the design. So at this stage, we're incorporating all those, that tested scope of application, the space that's required between certain pipes and cables, for instance, um, we're determining the size of the letterbox. So we're then going back out to the supply chain to make sure they're happy with the spacing. It may be for some reason that you can't have two types of cable in close proximity to each other yeah. because of um, you know, interference, aside to the fact that the tested scope of application from a fire perspective would permit it. Um, there may be limitations on the size of the letterbox as dictated by the wall system manufacturer, for instance. So it's important that we're bringing together all the tested solutions, how it could work, and then making sure with all the relevant yep. competent persons that it can be achieved, which obviously has um, great commercial advantages as well. You know, you, you're effectively pinning down all your different trades to say, yes, we agree with the design, we can achieve this design, on site, so there should be no hidden extras and, and, yeah. and complications once we get to the installation. So yeah, you're approving, you're making sure everyone's happy with the, with the design, and then of course you you're going to bring in your, your fire engineers and building control and maybe insurance warranty providers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to make sure they're all happy. And if there's any grey areas, if there's any non-standard or untested scenarios, really we've got to go all the way back to the beginning of the process and to identify what changes need to be made. Maybe we need to substitute a, a wall type, change a plastic pipe for a metal pipe, change an insulation for a different type, whatever it is to achieve the, the tested compliant detail. And then ultimately, once everyone's happy, once everything's approved, then the key thing is to go on and build. Yeah. But it's really just that the whole um, process is all about bringing together that tested scope of application and bringing together all the different trades, yeah. you know, rather than everyone doing their own thing um, and then expecting to be able to, to achieve compliance in the end. So yeah. ultimately, you know, you want to come out of the early engagement uh, process with a finalized design, which states exactly what detail you're using for each of the different services what those spacing requirements are so space to the edge of the letterbox space between space between services at the same time and ultimately the final size of the letterbox or indeed you know if we're talking about direct wall or direct floor seals the space between each of those seals yeah so yeah no it's, it's good it's kind of like I, I i sort of i like to use analogies and stuff so it's like a marriage of all different things you, you've got to like take all the aspects and make sure that you know, it's it's workable for everything, the wall manufacturer, us, dampers, fire doors. And um, like I said, there's other rules when it comes to gas regs, electrical regs, you know, it's got to be a marriage of that. And I think I've, I've said it before, and it's a bit of a cheesy thing, but if you have a wedding cake, you know, like a five tier wedding cake, you don't just start chucking ingredients in a bowl, mixing them up, go, oh, I'll just add chocolate here. It's a prescribed set of ingredients. There's steps, there's timings, there's amounts. It's a very, dictated thing to make sure that you get a wedding cake, not a wedding mess. And it's the same aspect here. You want to have that plan of action that you've taken the time and consideration to think of all the things that when it comes to site, it should just be, okay, A, B, C, and we're going to get it. Not A, F, G, Z, O, you know, we're getting 234. How would you get that from letters? It's too confusing. We need to have a strict plan. So yeah, that's, that's good. So Obviously, everyone there now sat there thinking, oh, that's great. Well done. We know the what and the why. You know, this this is new to us. It, it might not be new, but it is new to us. So how are Qualifier helping design teams and architects and M&Es 
do this sort of process and follow this process? How are we helping them? Yeah, great question. So I guess fundamentally at the heart of what we're doing is uh, education. Yep. So, you know, um, as we've discussed here, fire stopping is perhaps more complex than people have um, given time to think about. So, you know, there are lots of key considerations. It's not just a case of buying a four hour rated product and squirting it or sticking it or mechanically fixing it. There are lots of key considerations. Um, so we, we're trying to educate. Yeah. Um, and so indeed, you know, series like Burning Questions and all the other great content we're putting out there is helping with that. Um, but then there are some real tangible tools that we've, we've got. So um, our, one of our tools is what we call the information collection form. So I'm afraid it's nothing more glamorous than that. It is a form for collecting information about specific details or specific services and, and wall types and specific fire ratings in order for us to be able to provide specific tested solutions for each of those scenarios. So um, instrumental in uh, making your life a little bit easier, the yeah, ICF. Yeah. I mean, I mean, going back to earlier when we talked about this document, this explains there's a lot of questions that need to be asked. And this is kind of what we're trying to get early on is if you can give us specific information and, you know, they say there's over 37 questions. We don't ask that on this form. But if you can give us some uh, specific um, sort of information, um, then we can narrow down our tested library just for service penetration, just well over 300 details, and it's growing every month. We can narrow that down um, down to a, a select few. So we know that you've got cable tray, but you want a two hour fire rating. It's in a multi-service penetration seal. It's going for a double skin plasma wall. That starts to narrow it down. And um, I've said this before, um, when we've had some sort of teams meeting with Qualfire, um, <clears throat> if, if if you were to get, say to someone, oh, okay, I'll give you a million pounds to jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute, most of you are going to say straight away, no, no, I'm not going to do that. But if I was then to tell you, actually, no, I'll give you a million pounds to jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute, but the aeroplane is landed on the tarmac, you might think, well, actually, okay. Or is it, hang on, is it a jumbo jet? I might still hurt my legs. And then if I told you there's more information, that it's one of those small little planes, it's only two foot off the floor. You're going to start that more information. You go, yeah, I can do it. So your, your answer changes the more information you get. And the same with our technical team. If we get told I've got a pipe for a wall, oh, great, thank you. Here's here's all our pipes. We've got plastic, we've got MLC, we've got metal, we've got uh, a number of different types. But if we get that, it's a plastic pipe. It's a double skim wall. It's 60 minutes. It's just one pipe on its own. That huge library is down to one or two details. So even though it's a simple form, like you said, the the impact that has for our technical team is 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 um well it's unmeasurable really. It's a huge impact for us. So yeah, no, it's it's really helpful. So so say they the audience then fills this in. What what sort of the next step that happens after this then sort of thing? Um, we we provide them some some information sort of thing, don't we? So. Absolutely, yeah. So, so once we've got specific information, we can then identify our specific details, as Alex said, from, from the library, um, and we will then respond um, accordingly, spelling out effectively against each of these items, uh, which standard tested detail you can work to. That standard tested detail will then outline the, the parameters of the, of the tested scope. So in other words, the spacing, the size of the sealants, the fire rating it achieves, et cetera, et cetera, which is then where, as we talked about uh, previously, the architect or designer needs to bring together all those relevant details to make up the, the overall um, design. So if we were talking about the typical letterbox detail, then we're going to respond and said, well, for your cable tray, you're going to look at detail QB FW100 stroke D stroke 02, for instance. Um, the CPVC sprinkler pipe, we're going to be saying, okay, look at QB FW100 D05. And each of those specific details will spell out the size of the angulus of sealant, the space that's required, the space that it can be to the edge of the letterbox. They can then incorporate the design. Uh, and you know, fundamentally, it's it's good to understand that you know we are here to help understand why we're saying what we're saying. So just because we say use detail QBF to D02, and there's a whole lot of information on there that you should take into consideration, then we're here to you know, have a have a sit down, uh, have a teams meeting maybe, and um, talk you through why we provided that detail for that one and what all those specific measurements are about because it's key that you understand why you're doing and um, what you're doing um, unfortunately you know 
and I guess it's an improvement from the past, but we do have a bit of a copy and paste culture, um, which which is great. You know, if you're actually copying and pasting some information you've received and, it, and it's the right information, but it's, it's fundamentally you understand why you're doing what you're doing, which is, is where we're, we're keen to help with the education side of things. So we'll provide you the tools, we'll educate you um, and help you come up with that design, um, which you can then, of course, go and stick to the plan with. Yeah. Um, what else do we do? Well, we have um, MBS specifications and we have BIM models um, all to help with creating that design. And of course, uh, the all important uh, golden thread of information as well. So, which I know is a, a, yeah. a, a hot topic again, to use your expression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the golden thread is it, going to be very complex for those that were aware of Regulation 38, which is nothing new. I think that's been around since 2006, Regulation 38, but just people didn't realize that at the end of a project, you need to give the information across to the building owner. The golden thread is going to expand on that. and. Again, going back to the design process where you've been collecting this information from the manufacturer, it, it, it's leading up to build up. So eventually the fire stopper will have that. They know what detail they use, you know what products you've used. So it's, it's all going to be incorporated into that. So getting ahead of the curve because the golden thread is coming. Sort of learning this now is a good way forward. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing, obviously a way of helping with your previous slide actually, Craig, is you mentioned earlier that you should be flexible. So if we have the information that, okay, you want to use a certain type of pipe insulation, um, but you want a certain fire rating, it might be that we say, okay, you can use that, but it's only going to achieve this because of X, Y, Z. However, if you change it to this, yeah. you know, so we, we do also offer that scenario. We say that, okay, yeah, we can do what you've asked for, but it's not going to tick all the boxes. If you change it, you can do this. And that's one of the things I think we're quite good for is the integrity of, Okay, we say no, but we explain why, and that's why I think it's quite good for our technical team yeah. as well. So, things. so, of course, the obvious advantages of going to this level of detail at the design stage from a golden thread of information perspective is that you know you, you're doing all the hard yards up front, you're producing that information, and as long as you stick to the plan, then all you've got to do is make sure that what you've installed is as per the design, um, and that, that goes in, in, as you say, into your handover files and the, the golden thread of information. Yeah. No. So there are lots of advantages. It might require a bit of a cultural change, a change of thinking, um, maybe even changing some commercial agreements you might have got with key suppliers and partners. But there are advantages um, and it's certainly the way to go. And we'd have to say, Alec, as well, that um, change is happening. Yeah, and we are seeing positive changes. We are seeing uh, certainly tier one contractors embracing this approach, following the process. Um, sticking to the yeah. engagement concept and proving the benefits of doing so. Yeah, no, definitely. I think across all the industries that we work with, from architects, M&E, designers, even fire stoppers, sometimes, obviously, it's a learning curve for a lot of them. It may be the first time there's a lot of teething problems. There's a lot of sometimes butting of heads, so I'll be quite open with that, because, you know, some people have been used to doing it one way, and it's, it's a learning curve to explain why, but those that have embraced it, and sort of come on board have found that the more they do it the quicker and easier that they're doing to the point where I've, some projects i've worked on they finish one building for the second and that may have took a long time to design but on the second one it's pretty much the same so they just double checked with us gone is this and yep tick 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 and the, and the process was much quicker and the more they do it the more they do it the quicker and easier it becomes but you know it is a complex subject we're always happy to help and hopefully um yeah, um, anyone watching this that hasn't already tried us will um, get on board. But I think if, if you can, if you've used us and you've seen this work, comment and let, uh, let our audience know that, you know, it does work um, going about it. So, yeah, thanks for that, Craig. I know this is obviously a short video, but what we, I think, quite beneficial is if we just sort of do a summary of what we talked about. So the what, the why and the how. So is there any sort of thing you can tell the audience just to sort of summarise the key points to take away from this episode? Yeah, well, I think um, the key thing um, that, that we very much appreciate is that this may require a huge cultural change. And this might not be the way you've approached things in the past. Um, you might have tended to, to take that traditional approach, as I say, of kind of building the building um, and installing the fire stopper as a, a last minute or a, certainly a secondary trade. 
um, perhaps a lower value trade and, and it's not being given the, the attention. But it's important to remember that what we're talking about here is fire safety. We're talking about protecting people and property. We're talking about saving lives. So we do need to um, change. You know, we can't, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So it does require a huge cultural change and we appreciate that cultural change doesn't happen overnight. But we are here to, to assist. Um, and as I say, you know, just alluded to before, we are seeing change, positive change happening. Um, glad to glad to be part of that. Yeah. But yes, it really does mean uh, attention to detail. Um, it does mean that you've got to sort of start approaching this as life safety critical decisions rather than just commercial decisions. Um, and there are lots of advantages for it. There are what we call cost positive changes. Um, <clears throat> so cross party communication and coordination as well, you know, bringing all those trades together at an early stage, it might seem tedious, um, but it is well worth it. And ultimately it is essential in order to, to achieve um, fully tested um, um, scenarios. And look, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask for help. Um, competency, great big buzzword in the industry. What does it mean? Often we struggle with, with being able to define what competency means. I often say competency is all about knowing what you don't know, and that's okay. But the key thing is to be reaching out to those that do know. So bring together all your specialist trades, bring together the manufacturers who know their products and their systems and their um, tested parameters of their products Combine all that information and you will prove the benefits of it and you know, ultimately achieve and combine. So that'd be how I'd wrap it up. Yeah, I like, no, no. And um, um, I would say, obviously, this um, statement from, from you is, is a good thing for people to take away from as well. So obviously read, read that as well. So yeah, no, I really appreciate your time for joining me today on this and I hope everyone benefit. Like I said before, um, this is a very good, useful guide that Craig went through as well. So please get a copy and that's been put together with by a load of our organizations to help designers with this uh, sort of concept. But please get in touch with us. Um, the contact details will um, appear on the screen. Um, you can always get in touch with Craig, yourself, or the rest of our technical team or sales team. We're always more than happy to help. So um, from me, from Craig, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.